I'm Heidi Hutner, and this is Coffee with H Times 2. Today on our show, I'll be speaking with Eben Goodstein, the director of Bard Center for Environmental Policy and also their sustainability MBA. He's an environmental economist. He's written two books, a bunch of articles. Um, he's an educator. He's working on curriculum at Bard. So excited to have you here with us today. How are you? It's a pleasure to be here. So tell me what you're doing. You, you were an author. I mean, and you're still an author. Still author. Once an author, always an author. But now you're really focused more on education. How What's happening with that? Yeah, uh, we at, at Bard, I'm director of our graduate programs in sustainability, and um, I often talk about and give talks about how to get a job saving the planet. And and really, there's kind of three big spaces that folks can work in. Uh, one is policy, getting a job, changing the rules, uh, getting rid of bad laws and regulations, and putting in good laws and regulations. Uh, the second is education. And by education, I mean not just teachers and researchers, mm -hmm. but also artists and journalists and rabbis and imams and preachers and anybody whose job it is to communicate about the moral and scientific dimensions of the sustainability challenges we face. Um, and the third area is business. And people don't often think about business as being in the solutions bucket because businesses pollute and sometimes they exploit workers. But there's been increasingly a focus within the business community on how do we build businesses that are in business to solve social and environmental problems. So at Bard, we have graduate programs in all three of those spaces. Mm -hmm. We offer um, MS degrees in environmental policy and climate science and policy, uh, a new MED in environmental education, and then an MBA in sustainability. Uh, and, and our graduate program, every, every business program around the world now that has any aspiration to credibility has got a course or two in CSR, renewable energy or something. But, but our program is really one of a handful around the world that fully integrates sustainability into a core business curriculum and really says, you know, we teach economics and marketing and accounting, but every course is, is wrapped around this idea of how do I build a business that's in business to solve social and environmental problems. That makes sense. So very practical, very solutions-based. How to yep. get to it. Yep. Create your business and make it work. Mm -hmm. So tell, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Yep. You were a geologist first. Yeah. Uh, so I tried my, my, actually my parents, my, my dad was an economics professor and my mother was a his history professor. And I tried really hard not to become a college professor. <laughs> um, and so I majored in geology in college and worked as a geologist for a couple of years. But eventually my genes caught up with me and I ended up getting an econ PhD. Why econ? Um, well, I was very interested in science uh, and really loved the, the science uh, of geology. But at the end of the day, I was more interested in changing the world. Uh, and, you know, scientists do that very slowly at a geologic pace sometimes. Right. Um, uh, and I was much more interested in how do we actually you know, get out there and get our hands dirty in terms of solutions. Um, so how do economists do that? Well, uh, two ways, really. I mean, economics is, is a, I, I'm, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've sort of gravitated to be more of a generalist environmental uh, educator and a little bit away from economics, in part because um, I think that a little economics is extremely useful, mm -hmm. extremely useful, mm -hmm. because there's a set of toolkits to understand how markets work, how businesses work. Um, but actually, a lot of economics is kind of useless. Um, <laughs> and so I was more interested in how do we take kind of those basic toolkits, uh, but not just in economics, in leadership and uh, science, uh, politics, how do we bring all those together to help uh, to build really gr graduate curricula that can create people who can go, you know, change the future? Because you know, we're living at a truly extraordinary moment in the history of the human project. Right? We are. We, I mean, uh, 10,000 years of history have kind of crashed in the next three decades. And the students who are coming through our programs and yours have got to figure out how are we going to meet the needs of, you know, soon to be 9, 10, maybe 11 billion people in a world where we're already fighting over water and oil and topsoil and fish and forests and biodiversity mm -hmm. and, and where it's getting hotter all the time. I mean, we just had uh, unprecedented late season hurricane, you know, decimate the island of Haiti, destroy right. what was left of that island's economy, and the water was way too hot. Uh, right. And that's what we're dialing up, right? You know, we've had an increase in uh, the intensity of hurricanes across the world because the planet's getting warmer. And we've got to figure out, you know, how are we going to bend these curves? How are we going to create a world that is a livable a place for our kids and grandkids. And how do you think we can do that? 
Well, uh, really the three ways I just talked about. I mean, in some ways, I mean, you know, we've got to get to work changing the rules. Um, and we have so policy. policy work is important. And if we look at what happened in Paris last December, I mean, you know, finally, the, all of the nations of the earth came together and collectively committed to changing the direction that we're on, the path that we're on. Uh, you know, it's not good enough, but if we go back in 2020 with some deeper cuts and commitments, the Germans just this week uh, announced that uh, there will be no more internal combustion engines in Germany after 2030. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. And we're already seeing, you know, with Tesla and GM's Bolt, I mean, we're seeing the industry respond to this future already and they're developing the electric vehicle technology that's going to replace the internal combustion engine. And so you have to have this combination of folks in the business community who get this and who are trying to build different models. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you also need to have the policy push to sort of create the pathway for, for businesses to innovate and create that new future. And science, right? Engineers, oh, of course, of course, chemists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I put that kind of in in, in the business in, bucket in the business because it's bucket. collectively about how do we. How but do they we build have those to work solutions. with the scientists to be pushing them in that direction. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, some of those folks are, you know, are are supported by policy work. So NSF and R and D funding, all that stuff has to come right. out of the policy context to make this future a reality. And do you think enough of that is happening? Yeah. Never, um, never enough. I mean, no, I mean, my, you know, Hunter Lovins, who is one of my heroes in this space and who actually teaches in our MBA program in New York City, says that we're in a race to stop global warming. Right. Uh, and that's the good news. I mean, we're in a race. We haven't lost. But we have to right. live every day like we're racing. Right. Because that's the moment that we're living in. I mean, really, it may seem like a normal day outside, but it isn't, and it won't be for the rest of uh, our lives and, and the lives of, of the students in your classes. And their so, children's lives. And their children. I mean, you know, this is a, a century-long process to, you know, get our hands around climate stability, but also, you know, the related challenge of deforestation, biodiversity loss, toxics, uh, um, uh, environmental justice questions. You know, all of these things come together really in, in, in a giant web of, of issues, but also, I mean, the good news is that solutions in one space we can think systematically about how solutions in one space mm -hmm. can be solutions in the other. So what are the biggest things we need to be focusing on now? I mean, I, you know, you talked just about food. We know the, all this alarm with bees, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. pollination, if that, yeah. if we can't just, we can't just focus on carbon, we also have to focus on toxics, right? Yeah. So the, yeah. all these pieces. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, so my, my yeah, I think that individually we need to sort of pursue our own passions because right. there's, great work to be done in all kinds. People come ask me, say, what's the best field to get into? And right. I say, well, the one you love, right? Because there's work to do in that space. Right. Um, and, you know, should I be an engineer or, or, or an artist? And I say, well, you know, whatever your gift and talent is, right. because all of those tools are critical to coming together to solve the problems. I interviewed Josh Fox, you know, mm -hmm. the filmmaker yeah. of Gasland yeah. and this new one, Let Go and Love. Yeah. So he, he said the same thing. He said, you have to find the thing that you love the most. Yeah. Um, that's the one you'll do well at. He said, I would be a terrible, you know, scientist, but I'm good at this yep. and I love doing this. So, yep. um, well, my class that I'm teaching now is, is a class on utopias. Yeah. And um, we're in an interesting moment in terms of the election. Mm -hmm. This is, in, we are. you know, someone might be watching this in the future, but we are pre-election. Uh, we don't know whether our, our president will be um, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or Jill Stein. Statistics don't doesn't <laughs> look like that will bear out or, you know, any of these other independent candidates. But, but it'll probably be one of those two, the first two. Yeah. Any thoughts about the election, the environment? Um, well, I mean, a couple thoughts. I mean, uh, this the election is is hugely significant for climate policy. Right. I mean, the, the candidates are about as far apart as you could imagine on that dimension. And f for us to stay engaged in Paris, I mean, Trump has said he would cancel the accord, withdraw. Clinton has said she would stay engaged. Uh, it's... If, if the international process is going to go forward, it's critical that this next president, 2020, goes back to um, the international climate meetings with a set of proposals for deeper cuts. If the U.S. doesn't show up, China doesn't show up, India doesn't show up, the whole thing falls apart. Mm. And the deal in Paris unravels. And we go, Paris was really amazing because it, it took us from what 
three years ago was an eight degree Fahrenheit future this century, eight degrees Fahrenheit. Now, put that number in perspective during the last ice age, you know, when much of New York State was covered by thousands of feet of ice, the world was only nine degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is right now. So up until two or three years ago, you know, the students in your class were, were really facing a swing in global temperatures of ice age magnitude only in the opposite direction. Now Paris gets that down to six, which isn't good enough. Uh, and, and so we have to go back with another set of proposals to get us down to four. I've been giving a lot of talks about kind of the whole evolution of American politics. I mean, it's fascinating to step back because from the point of view of today's young people, you know, Washington has just been a partisan gridlock swamp as far as they've been alive on social and economic issues, but global climate change and environmental issues as well. And it's understandable why people are not that engaged because it just seems like there's no space for action. You know, Republicans say worried about governmental overreach, you know, uh, many of them denying that climate change even exists. Democrats really worried about it, ready for activist government policy, and there just seems to be no space for, for dialogue. But that's not American history. I mean, for much of the 20th century, America had this sort of very profound bipartisan centrist commitment to environmental protection, going back to Teddy Roosevelt, right. the National Parks, Forest Service, and then in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and even into the 90s, 25 years of like incredible legislative achievement and the creation of a globally leading environmental legislative framework. And that included Republican Presidents Richard Nixon, Republican President Ronald Reagan, Republican President George H.W. Bush, mm -hmm. uh, who the very last thing that he did was sign the International UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the first international treaty on global warming ratified by the Senate that actually enabled the Paris talks last December, so for 25 years. But the last 25 years, nothing, nothing. So what, what caused that shift? Right, what caused what, it? What caused it? It's a complicated story, um, but it's basically, if you step back, it, it's, it's really, well, I'm gonna see if I can do this quickly, okay? Beginning in the 70s, and yeah, really the 70s, you had the emergence of something called movement conservatism in opposition to moderate conservatism. Hmm. Um, it actually was very consciously created. Um, a bunch of uh, conservative intellectuals were worried about liberal ascendancy in the 60s, so they, they, they funded a sort of think tanks and other media organizations mm -hmm. to create sort of what is a conservative. And somehow, over the course of that next ensuing 10, 20, 30 years, conservatives began to adopt this identity that involved opposition to environmentalism. Because environmentalism in the 60s and 70s was like mom and apple pie. Right. Because we cleaned up you know, horrible air pollution and water pollution. And that transition is really what explains the partisanship. I see. Was that sort of, along with you know, being you know, pro-gun and anti-abortion mm -hmm. and in favor of privatizing Social Security and Medicare, uh, conservative identity became Conservatives are opposed to action right. on the environment. Bound up in that. Yeah, and it got reinforced in the, it, with media bubbles and Fox News right. and Breitbart and all that stuff. Um, and, and that's where we are. And if you look at public opinion, back in 1990, 75% of Democrats and 75% of Republicans in a Gallup poll agreed that we were spending too little on the environment. Incredible figure. Extraordinary. Incredible figure. And now what's happened is Democratic public opinion has stayed roughly constant, but Republican public opinion has really fallen off. So now it's more like 30%. Okay? Now what that means is that you still have 30% of Republicans who really care about the environment, right? right. But they don't have a voice in the party. Um, and so I think the real question is sort of uh, post-Trump and with the polls looking the way they are, that looks like that's going to happen sooner rather than later, right. um, that, that those folks are going to, have an opportunity to kind of reemerge and rebuild a space in the center for a dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, for a more moderate dialogue about engaging around the environment. Wouldn't that be helpful if we could enter that, that conversation? Yeah. Where it's not so oppositional, where there's some listening and taking in of the science and the information and really working together. Yeah, and I think that's going to happen. I mean, because I think that, that, that those, those folks exist, and I think the structures that have created the polarization right. are have, now are kind of disassembling well, right now. They could. They, they, they certainly could. could uh, you know, uh, in the coming couple of years. 
It's interesting. An interesting yep. moment. Well, it is an interesting and, moment. And an opportunity. Yep. yep. So we have to end. Yeah. Um, I, I could t listen to you for hours and talk to you for hours. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have much more to share. Yeah. Um, I, I love that you're coming from these multi backgrounds mm -hmm, and now mm -hmm. you're doing more, much more education. Yeah. Um, so uh, I thank you so much for coming on. And um, so this is, we've, I've been speaking with Eben Goodstein from Bard College. Uh, he runs their environmental and sustainability programs there, um, an environmental economist. So thank you for watching. You can see more of our episodes on HeidiHutner.com. Take care.